Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Driscoll in Dallas, Texas. We are discussing Devised Work, your first show, and Jewel Lighting, all on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. That's right. Welcome, everyone, to episode 230. What is this? 233. 233. 233. <laughs> we have almost, you know, our fifth year is coming to an end. When, what, wait, when is that? I can't do the math because you're going to divide by 52. It's going to be, I, I don't know. I, I think the actual date is March. Yeah, it's in March. So it's, we're still half a year away. So anyway, it's good, it's good that we're four and a half years uh, through this. Uh, we have another, what, five and a half to go, and then we all retire. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, today we have our special brother. He's a special brother, Driscoll Otto, joining us. Hey, Driscoll, how you doing, man? Hey, y'all. I'm good. I, uh, <laughs> I'm here in Dallas. I'm working with Steve every Friday and raising two little boys while trying to continue a career designing video and lights, so... How old are your sons now? Uh, one of them turned five last week, and the other one is six and a half. Did you buy him a pony? I did not. Um, <laughs> that, that is you, Texas you call gift, yourself a Texan, right? We did get a, right, right. Did get a bounce house for his birthday party. Oh, okay. So he, he pretended that was a pony. <laughs> you know, you, you're not afraid of a tornado coming and flying that bounce house like taking off into the stratosphere. I mean, I mean I've heard of that happening. I, we just rented it for the day, so no. Oh, okay. <laughs> did, did you personally bounce in the bounce I house? I did, and my back was so sore the next day. <laughs> I was like jumping around, hitting the walls, and having a good time, and then I realized that at forty something years old, it hurts when you do that. No, no, no. You'll be feeling that for a while. Did you did you rent a clown? Did you hire a clown? Um, I did not. Uh, my father-in-law is kind of the clown. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> it's good to have a clown in the family. That's all I have to say. <laughs> but anyway, it's great to have you back with us, Driscoll. Let's get on with the show. But before we get started, we have Letters to Light Talk Central. So we got a lot of letters in, you know, about our past shows, but we just got a letter in this morning about something that happened this past weekend, and that is the MTV VMA Awards Show, which we'll be talking about more during our Let's Talk About segment. But this is actually a letter from Art Steva from Transfer Junction, Missouri, and Art writes, Jerks. <laughs> <laughs> he starts it off with jerks. You believe that? I mean, we got morons. We got everything. For some reason, these letters that get through our censors, they always choose the ones that insult us right at the top. But anyway, jerks. This past weekend, me and the missus watched the MTV VMA award show. We were shocked at the total depravity that this show exhibited. It was all about sex, 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 and more sex. Whenever there was a crowd shot, there were hundreds of blonde women squeezed next to each other so tightly that I could swear they shared sexual organs. They were jumping up and down, and in some cases were so animated that it looked like they were all hopped up on speed. Use pharmaceuticals in moderation, young things. Are all the girls in California blonde? I could swear that I saw no brunettes, redheads, or other normal colored hair in that audience, and certainly no men. I told the missus that maybe we should move to California, but she quickly told me that the show was actually televised from Brooklyn, then showed me the, work, <laughs> the working end of her shotgun. Someone call the fire brigade. What's with all the fire? Are these songs sent from the devil? I thought that Kiss and Black Sabbath retired. And finally, why do lighting designers have to flash the lights so much? The strobing caused Uncle Ralph to spit up several times. I know that I had to change my underwear twice during the show. So please tell your colleagues to ease up on the light flashing. I can't hear the lyrics when I have continuous epileptic fits. And speaking of the lyrics, in the old days we used to listen to the words of the music. Now it's all about big bottoms. Want to see some big bottoms? Just come to a Steva family reunion. Yours in truth, Art. Art did not pull any punches. I think he was looking more at the crowd than anything else, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and what was un Uncle Ralph spit up? Well, he, it says Uncle Ralph spit up several times. I don't know what that means. 
put your chihuahua to bed when you turn on MTV. Don't, don't, let, don't let it watch it. Don't feed it. Well, we must say that we watched it. We kind of loved it. And we're going to talk more about it later. So let's get started. Steve has our first listener question. Judith in France writes, what was your first show you designed and how do you feel about it now? Judith, I, you know, I thought about that and I looked back to when I was a sophomore in uh, college uh, working with highly skilled junior actors and we did The Little Prince, which actually you probably know, uh, Le Petit Prince. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a second, but you know, the book was not good enough for us. So we turned it into a devised piece. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing. We had <laughs> no idea what we were doing. You know, we, we took this thing, which is, you know, 140 million copies has been sold, translated into 301 languages and dialects. Do we want to work, you know, from the, from the, the language? No, we'll work from our emotions and <laughs> create something. It was horrible. You know, I look back and I, I drew my little half inch light plot and I had 24 six inch Fresnels and a dozen six by nines. I had a two scene preset console. And I remember vividly my lighting design teacher coming to me and, and saying, so why did you put those lights on stage left? <laughs> and I had no idea, <laughs> except that it was a thrust. <laughs> and I knew someone was, some of the 50 people the theater sat would be over there watching it. So I look back on The Little Prince with horror. Uh, at the time, I thought it was great, and uh, you know, but I look back on it now, and it's like something I don't want to remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember that far back. Driscoll, how about you, man? Uh, what was your first show? My first show was All My Sons in High School um, that, that, that I designed. I, we were working on a lot before then, but... Uh, that was back in the day when I didn't know that you could use more than just a full system at a time, that we had just enough light to light the people on the stage. Uh, I remember finding a gobo in our lighting closet and asking what it was and my teacher explaining it. And I got really excited and she said, well, you're never going to be able to use that because we don't have enough lights. If you take one away to use that, you won't see anybody on stage. Um, it wasn't true. Ultimately, after, you know, getting a little bit more experienced, I, I learned how to use our our very slim two scene preset, but uh, with the lights we had and have some actual design happening. But that first one, it was rough. It was, uh, you know, the thunderstorm was like just flashing the flash button on on the two scene preset. Um, do y'all remember that? Oh, that was that was preparing you for the storm scene in uh, Cow in a Hot Tin Roof. Yes, exactly. Which we did like two years later. So <laughs> all the classics. <laughs> and and did you find a way to use your snowman scobo in all my sons? No, I ne I never I never found a way to use the gobo. I was not allowed to. Do you remember what it was? I think it was clouds. I think it was some uh, sort of cloud been nice. or something. That would have been nice. Yeah, it could have been great. Um, but you know that was that was before I had truly learned what design was. That was when you're just the lighting guy. You know, had you had had you committed? Were you thinking, this is my career once you turned on that two-scene preset board? No. <laughs> I was, that was like, hey, I finally found a cool group of people to hang out with, and I enjoy this lighting thing. Um, there, it was never a, oh, this is actually something I could do until I got into my junior or senior year in high school. It was the summer at uh, the University of Texas. They had a summer theater program for high school students that I learned about design from Dr. David Nancaro. Um, I know David Nancaro. I yeah, knew him. Yeah, yeah. He, he was amazing. He taught me yeah. my first class on design. How about your first projection design? That was for the musical Hair in Montana, in Whitefish, Montana. <laughs> uh, I was interested in projections, and I had said something to the artistic director, and she said, well, why don't you come light Spelling Bee and do projections for Hair? And I said, awesome. And so I did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's a good show. Yeah. Actually, both of those shows are good shows. Actually, all three of those shows are good shows. I mean, All My Sons is maybe my favorite Arthur Miller show. It's so good. And when it's only 40 minutes long, it's even better. 
Yeah. <laughs> 40 minutes? How the hell do you do that? It's like the Disney production. It's, it's, that's how the, in Texas they have all these uh, one-act play contests. And so there was like the 40-minute version of uh, All My Sons. It really moves. Lots of drama in 40 minutes. <laughs> oh, God. It's intense the way it is. I can't imagine squeezing all that in. So anyway, my first show, I was also a sophomore in college, and it was uh, for William Saroyan's The Time of Your Life, where I not only lit it, I also composed it, and I also acted in it. Oh, wow. And it was insane. Yeah. It was totally insane. Uh, Gene Wright was the director, and uh, <laughs> was a dear, dear, was a dear friend of mine before he passed on. And uh, uh, John Haupt was the set designer. A lot of people know who John is on the show. Uh, he was you know, one of the chief uh, designers at Disney for many, many years. But anyway, I don't remember anything about the lighting except that it was very moody. Uh, but I do remember the music, and I probably wrote the best song I ever wrote in my entire life on that show, which is a shame when your high point hits at 18. <laughs> so that's the only thing I remember. Well, I mean, you, I mean, you, you have something similar now with Mozart. Who? What? Yeah, Mozart. Mozart. <laughs> you and Mozart have in common. <laughs> I don't think I have anything in common with Mozart. <laughs> What's what, what? What? What do we have in common? That we we hit our high point at eighteen. Oh, I think so. I uh, think so. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. Let's go on to our next question. <laughs> Zach from Maryland asks: Now that my travel budget is decimated. How do I get all the experiences that I was getting out of trade shows without actually going to trade shows? Hmm. That's, that's a good question, Zach, from Maryland. Um, well, you were talking about uh, one of the manufacturers uh, and the cost of booths at trade shows and how like getting them out to universities and such uh, could be better money spent than in the actual like conventions, right? Something I know nothing about, so I'm perfectly willing to talk about it. I think if you're a salesman, probably what you're trying to get to are lots and lots of university students because eventually those university students are going to turn into clients and people who specify your work. And I think um, the trade shows, I think they're pretty good for professionals who are coming in for a day and taking a look at something that maybe following up with a trip to a, a manufacturer somewhere. But I think, you know, somewhere there's going to come a reckoning here. Uh, money's going to get tighter. How do you reach all of these people who can't? You know, if you think about it, you know, can I, can I really go to um, SETC, then USITT, then go to LDI? You know, how many trade shows can I go in, go to in a year? And, you know, which ones do I cycle and go to every other year? So I think um, Zach brings up a good point. Uh, universities are cutting back their travel budgets. It's becoming more and more difficult uh, to get on the road. People are worried about their health a little bit. I think what happens um, is that we underestimate uh, the kind of uh, determination that an ETC or a Strand or a Clay Packy or a Martin or an Elation has to come and visit you. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at these guys, some of these guys do their own little mini tours around the country. Elation was just out doing this. Martin has done it. Uh, you know, they're very clear about the markets they go to. They seem to, in one year, go to the major cities, and the second year they go to the secondary cities. So, I you know, I think if you're out in Whitefish, Montana, <laughs> uh, you might have to get in the car and drive over to uh, Helena, <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, or Bo you might have to drive to a city to see them. But I think you need to contact people and say, you know, what can we do? Can, I mean, a lot of manufacturers have budgets to send equipment to you. They're, you know, they're not going to send you a, a dozen moving lights, but they might send you one for you to mess around with for a couple weeks in class and get to know what it's going to do. I know, I mean, they have loaner consoles. This isn't their first rodeo. So you have to be proactive and you have to talk to these people and see what is reasonable. You know what? Um, often when I have stuff shipped to me, I'm, I'm uh, on the hook for um, insurance once it arrives on my facility, which, which is nothing really. And sometimes I've worked with people where they have shipped me something and I've uh, absorbed the cost of shipping it back. So there are trade-offs here, but I think you can get equipment to your university. And that might be uh, 
in some ways, a calmer place to look at your you know, potential purchases than uh, elbowing your way around uh, people trying to grab a T-shirt at a booth well, you're somewhere. definitely going to get more one-on-one attention from them, and they're going to be listening to your needs, which is probably one of the number one things that they need to know about when they're telling you what gear of theirs. Sure. I mean, you're, you're, you're certainly the focus of their attention at that moment. Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt about that. What do you think, David? You guys bring, bring up some really good points from consumers' points of view. But you know, a lot of the trade shows is about manufacturers selling to dealers, yeah. And, uh, and, and making deals mm-hmm. and saving or, you know, or making an extra ten twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 here or there. And a big part of that scene is making contacts and face to face. And a lot of times you don't have, you know, especially if you're a smaller company or if you're a smaller dealer and you're trying to make an impact, those types of events are very important for that. It's just a part of the deal making thing. And I don't know if doing it from home on Zoom is the answer for that type of uh, purpose. Uh, you know, it's interesting because NAM has just announced that they are postponing their big show that's normally in January here in Anaheim till uh, June. Oh, wow. Which means that the summer NAM in Nashville is not going to happen. Yeah. But it's going to be here in Anaheim. But, you know, now the NAM show is totally different because I, I decided, I, last time I was at NAM was two years ago. It was the last time they had it. And I decided I'm never going back. Because it is ridiculous. It's just too crowded. It's too noisy. And you go to listen to equipment or listen to musical instruments, and you can't hear them because it's too noisy. <laughs> so, so I don't know what people are doing. Yes, you get your hands on them, but what are you going to do? You're, you're much better. Now, a situation like NAM actually would work online much better because then you could lis- really listen to the, to the instrument. Mm-hmm. right? But, in you know, like let's take USITT or LDI or something like that. You're looking at lights. And I don't know about you all, but I don't trust these uh, things we see from the manufacturers, these videos, right? Where like they're saying, look, this is what the light does. Yeah, it's kind of cool, but we're in 2D. We don't know really how bright it is. Mm. They get futz with a camera. It could look brighter than it really is. And, you know, that is something you really need to see in person, which is why in L.A. here, I'm fortunate I have uh, manufacturers everywhere. And I can just go down and they can give me a demo live of their new lights. Uh, Not everyone can do that. I know that. And that's where the Internet comes in hand. Andy. But I don't. I, you know, I kind of agree with uh, with Steve and uh, Driscoll that you've got to be proactive and you got to go out there. And if, you, if there's something you don't see, and if you can't make it to LDI and you can't make it to these other places, and, and if you live in the middle of nowhere, then you need to like see it online. Yeah. Well, a lot of these conventions, as you say, is about networking. Yes. Yeah. Me- meeting people, shaking their hands. You know, going to classes, mm-hmm. getting some stuff that you can't get anyplace else. Yeah, the classes are great. Yeah. I mean, I've taken several projections classes uh, there over the years, and that's where I first met Zach. As a matter of fact, it was at one of these uh, uh, projection uh, video classes there, and uh, it was great. I, it was a really, you know, and I got to meet Bob. I didn't know Bob. Uh, you know, this is how I networked. I'm an established designer, but I had never met these cats, so <laughs> it was great to be able to actually meet them, you know, one on one. So, our friend Drew Belinsky writes, Hello, Lumen Brothers. Hope you have been well. It's been a while, but I have a question for you. Beginning this October, I will start working on designing lights for a devised play. This is my first time ever working on a devised project. What differences from the usual scripted play should I expect, and how should I adjust my preparation processes to make sure I contribute well and make the production a success? Well, you're talking about my type of theater here. (laughs) I mean, uh, really, I love devised theater because devised theater, you got to understand something. When you're working on a devised play, you are one of the writers of the play. Everybody in the company is writing the play. Right now, obviously, if you have a director, which you usually should have, they're going to be the, the ones with the final say on what <laughs> on what lines go in and out or what the show is about. But you are actually one of the playwrights or one of the composers or even one of the lighting designers or one of the choreographers. It's a much more open, uh, organic type of process. So you know, you're asking about, you know, how can you prepare? Be open, be open, be open, be open. You know, and all, good, all good lighting designers are open to change. 
So this this is why I love devised uh, devised plays. You know, also being a jazzer, you know, that's it's pretty much devised all the time. We know the melody, we know what the song's about, but who knows what's going to happen from moment to moment? That's why I love devised theater. Have fun. <laughs> What do you guys think? The, the device theater is some of the most fun there is out there. Um, you are a collaborator in a way that you're never a, a collaborator as a lighting designer because, like you said, you are a character in a way, helping to create this piece. The hardest thing is, you know, a lot of times your light plots do well before they actually start working on the piece. And so I, I'm always trying to figure out how I give myself the toolkit I need to be able to tell the story we want to tell. And as you said, flexibility is key, right? Like we may hang a plot, we may focus it and we may have to change a lot of it because the ideas shift along the way. So it really is about being flexible and hopefully the team around you is flexible. Yeah. Use a lot of moving lights. <laughs> that's, that's what I say. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've done this with uh, Lynn Jenkins and David Rabe and each of them have a line that I've contributed um, in the work. So I love it. I love sitting there, talking with everybody, going, working through the play, looking at different ways to stage things, different ways to compose things on stage. What if we did this? What if we did that? So I think this is a perfect kind of opportunity um, for you, Drew. Just you're on the ground floor and your voice counts as much as anyone else in the room. So I would not be shy about sharing ideas and I would not be resistant to listening to things coming back. Yeah. And remember, Drew, this is a great opportunity to work on your first world premiere because that's what it will be. Your name will go in the program it for everyone the program. to see forever. <laughs> that's, that's what I love about uh, it. You see these little theaters somewhere in this like design team who, you know, lives in Whitefish, Montana. Is They get their name for everyone to see for, you know, everybody that ever produces the play it's amazing you know and i've done several world premieres but i don't think my name ever made into the really the script no yeah. way oh, that's yeah. the best part yeah. well samuel I, french well, I, you gotta call them i buy a script for my daughter for everyone i do wow uh i guess you know people are gonna forget my name i'm not immortalized i gotta do something to make to become immortalized well there is that statue that we're building for you out on the beach but on the beach, <laughs> Dallas. <laughs> you don't want to be immortalized with your middle name. You know, it doesn't want to be David Martin Jacques, because that's always what they do for serial killers and assassins. It's David Jacques. I'm going to go by my stage name, which is Jacques Maton. So oh, I like that. Right. Yes, that's my name. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you are listening to Light Talk, and today's episode is sponsored by... From across the mighty Pacific... It's Pet Sweat of Japan. That's right, coming to you from the far east. Or if you're in Australia, the near north, it's Pet Sweat of Japan. And today we offer three new easy-to-make Halloween treats for the busy stagehand. Are you tired of just bringing a bag of candy to the annual Halloween party? Well, nothing says Halloween like hard-boiled eggs, pizza sauce, <laughs> processed cheese, toast, and chocolate. That's right, hard-boiled eggs. Holding the egg in your hand, slice the egg lengthwise, top to bottom. Now prepare your grave site of trim toast. Garnish with pizza sauce and cheese in a can. Place the egg yolk down and apply melted chocolate to create eyes, nose, and a stitched mouth. Better prepare a lot. Once word gets out, you will become local one for trick-or-treat night. But wait! Why not serve a few jack-o'-lantern rice balls? Start by boiling your rice with a touch of ketchup and cinema to give it a pumpkin orange glow. Form into a ball, cut eyes, nose, and mouth from seaweed, and apply. And finally, coy delight. <laughs> Did you just hand out a fish to a kid? Don't worry, this sweet treat is a Halloween favorite. First, take your tiny koi. Gut and debone the little guy. Choose your own favorite filling. I like sweetened pureed squid. And now through Thanksgiving, look for our pumpkin spice cow piss. Nothing says autumn like a warm, steamy mug of cow piss. Pet sweat of Japan. Always something good in the kitchen for the hungry stagehand. And now back to light talk. 
<laughs> Unless you need to take a minute and vomit. <laughs> no, that'd be great, man. That'd be great. Speaking of vomit, I, this this week, past weekend, I went to the, the annually. I go at, at, at Catalina. There's something called Catalina Wine Mixer. The Catalina <laughs> Wine Mixer, right? It's from that <laughs> from that uh, movie called The Step Brothers with Will Ferrell and whatever is that guy's name. Was a great actor, by the way. It was fantastic in, in whatever that Chicago. Anyway, all that being said, <laughs> you take a boat to Catalina. It's this really cool boat. It takes like an hour and ten minutes, and which is fine. But we took. The, we took the boat coming back from Catalina, which was like at 1030 at night, and everybody was drunk on the boat. So you can just imagine what that boat was. There were like, I don't know, 200 passengers on this boat. It was a whole mess, man. Oh. I tell you, I felt real sorry for the, for the people who work on that boat. But, you know, what are you going to do? So <laughs> brought to you by the Catalina wine mixer. And to all of our high school students listening to this, ask mom and dad for tickets now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Next year is Catalina wine mixer. I highly recommend it. We're not sure what that has to do with lighting, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and that, <that's>, and <laughs> well, the sound of those rabbit ducks means that once again, it's time for let's talk about. And today's let's talk about is all about, Hey, guess what? It's the MTV VMA award show. <laughs> Yay. Yay. I'm telling you. Okay. So I'm at home, right? Uh, on s- past Sunday night and I get a call and it's Lori and Lori tells me, turn on the TV. I can't believe what Justin Bieber's wearing. And I'm saying, what? <laughs> so I turn on the TV and there's the MTV VMA award show. And Justin Bieber is wearing these pants. So first of all, they're big baggy jeans that are down by his knees, okay? (laughs) And he's wearing a black hoodie with the hood up and a sports jacket over it. Now, I don't know where he got this, but... Oh, he went classic. He went went classic. (laughs) Classic. Retro. What's retro? There's nothing retro. This was just... It was like... Whose closet did he get this out of? So anyway, I, I'm, I'm watching it because I'm saying, oh, this is an award show. You know, somebody I know probably lit it. So, I, so I'm watching it. And then I see this act named Chloe. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is a lot of strobe lights. <laughs> Actually, it was just basically fixtures that are randomly strobing on her. And I'm saying, wow, okay. And I'm getting tired of this. But I'm starting to listen to the lyrics. I'm getting a little scared. Now, understand right now I'm under medication. So I'm thinking, am I hallucinating this? Because this is really weird and scary. So I called Lori up and I said, Lori, are you seeing what I'm... She goes, yes, this is really scary. So then I watched the rest of the show. It was fantastic. What do you guys think? (laughs) That's all I'm going to (laughs) say. Chloe, 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 Chloe. You, I'm, I'm here for you, darling. Oh man, Viva Las Vegas, baby! Viva Sir, Viva Opera! What an opening, man! That was just you know that got your attention. Yes, it got my attention. And then, and, 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 then, and then it was it was great lighting for music and dance. You know, it's a study in green, and that floor work. The lighting designer did not walk over the projections. Nope. You know, Chloe, I'm, I'm going to have that whole video tattooed on my back. It was, it was fantastic. Oh. And just in case you didn't notice, the projection designer had booty so big projected behind her. Just in case you didn't know what the song was about. <laughs> so it was like, tasteful. I think it was in Hilbeckia. The pieces I saw tasteful. were nice. I think they did a good job. It felt like the Video Music Awards. It felt right. Yeah. It had an ener- yeah. a good energy. Um, I, I liked the architectural stuff. And I think the floor projections were out of this world at times and they went away. That is the most powerful part of it. Sometimes they went away. And then when they came back, it actually was special. I'm trying to think of the act that had the the waves that were crashing, you know, on the floor and also oh, behind them. That was that the, was uh, 21 Pilots. Yeah, 21 Pilots. That was great. It started off, he was playing a ukulele. It was very low key with just static lights on, <laughs> on him and the drummer and, uh, and these, I guess, uh, two or three singers, background singers. And it was like, oh, this is classy. This is going to work. You know, I mean, it sort of reminds me of the Grammys in a bit. You know, it's kind of nice. And then all of a sudden he takes the damn ukulele and throws it out into the audience. <laughs> People are like clamoring for it, right? For the stupid ukulele. Forget, oh, by 
the way, forget about any social distancing, like our letter said. <laughs> People were all over themselves. It was nuts. But anyway, and then all the, the, the projections started, like Driscoll said. And that was really cool, I must say. But there was nothing but all this smoke and this, this, this fire, you know, and this water. And I don't know. It just got very, very busy for me. But hey, that's what it is. It is busy. The music is busy. So the designers definitely supported the music, which is why I loved it. Hello? Yes. No, we're listening. We're listening. <laughs> we're listening. <laughs> you, we're listening. <laughs> you were just going and going. Don't, and don't hold back. Don't hold yeah, back. Let us know what you think. <laughs> All right. So surely, surely no one has a complaint about Olivia Rodrigo. Come on. You know, I'm a sucker for purple. It was old school. <laughs> she comes flying in and landing on stage. It was clean. The camera loves her. She loves the camera. You know, I loved it that they turned the spaceman purple. The audience was purple. Purple never really left. It was always there. Sometimes it was a suggestion. Sometimes it was front and center. Center, you know, no butts in that one. That was good, clean, wholesome fun. (laughs) What do you think there, Driscoll? What did you think of Olivia? I I thought it was beautiful. I'm a sucker for purple, too. And I'm a sucker for purple used well with, like, great accents, which I think that piece had a lot of. Um, So, yeah, I, I... I stand by it. <laughs> Can anyone deny that Chloe did green quite well? I yeah. have to go back and look at yeah. that. And not only was the lighting and the projection artist so good in Chloe, she never got lost on stage yeah. no matter what was happening. And they did a beautiful button at the end. It was just like, boink, button. A great tribute to, to Sound of Music, button, <laughs> at the end of that song. <laughs> I didn't notice the button. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Driscoll, take us down the garden path with Machine Gun Kelly. Uh, you know, it was it was pretty intense. I love that, like laying on the floor kind of feel, like that be opening of it, and then the, the red way, the red dancers. Yeah, and then it just got like, I mean, that was the one that I felt was really beautiful, and then got a little flash and trashy for my taste and just like so many strobes started happening and that's where i sort of like i like i I, i'm into strobes but i'm into like very curated strobing and i feel like machine gun kelly went a little crazy with the strobing well how do you feel about his kick drum uh let me go back was it was it big enough it was like 18 feet tall or something i may have missed that it was giant stage right it was a giant kick yeah i thought i was hallucinating that but i guess it really was there (laughs) (laughs) i was afraid to say something and who doesn't love to see a guitar smashed on stage you know (laughs) i mean come on that's retro talk about you know bring it back to pete townsend destroying his guitar and hendrix and all those people hendrix lit his guitar on fire or early vmas where I think it was uh, uh, what's his name from the Foo Fighters oh the Grohl Dave Grohl Dave Grohl threw his guitar straight up in the air and then it came back and hit him on the head and like knocked him yeah. out that was like one yeah, of the first Dave VMAs Grohl's not Richie Blackmore <laughs> Richie Blackmore knew how to do that you know Dave Grohl I could see being kind of you know awkward with that but he's like grow, like that was early Dave Grohl modern Dave Grohl is like a legend no, that's because, that's because he stopped doing drugs. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> back then he was probably high as a kite and that hit that thing to get him in the head. You can't, like, throw guitars up in the air if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, you can keep your fancy opera and your dance. I want to see some guy <laughs> smash a guitar on his head. <laughs> I've seen it. It's not a pretty sight. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back. What year was that? I got to check that out. But anyway. Uh, it was like 91. <laughs> Speaking of Dave Grohl, I'm telling you, Dave, the Foo Fighters were great, but they played like old songs. I, you know, I'm just like, what the hell's going on here? I see. I love hearing them play the stuff I know. I get, you know, I'm at that age where there's a lot of stuff that's happened in between that I don't know. And so I'm just like, oh, that's that's cool. But I really like hearing the anthems that I'm like ready to rock out to. The Foo Fighters are always great. Yeah. Yeah. Just Give it up for the Foo Fighters. Yeah, I like the Foo Fighters. I thought the lighting, I remember a lighting show. I thought the lighting was fabulous in that show because that was the first performer that did not have some sort of ridiculous amount of strobe lighting on them. There was some strobe, but it was done tastefully. And the floor didn't light up until another section in the show. They had they had to have the floor back because you know, that floor, whenever it's not lit and they had a higher camera angle, yeah. it kind of looked like a dead dark gray. Yeah. It was not a pretty floor when it was a high angle. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd have to go back and look at it again. But, you know, soon we'll see all the specs come out on one of the trade magazines so we can actually, like, 
look at it all. I love that uh, the light wall they had. It was just like old school, you know, rock and roll tour. It was amazing. Yeah, it was a good light wall. It yeah. really was. You know, you thought you knew what that rig was going to do. Uh-huh. You thought, okay, they're gonna, it's going to be the wall. They're going to do the wall all night. Then they segue to the lasers. Then they segue to the projection. You know, the lighting designer just, that that lighting rig bent and bended and broke and rose. and I mean, it was fantastic, everything that he or she got out of it. Okay, so uh, for the Foo Fighters, Kirsten Hovland did the video, and that was really terrific. She works with a company called Electronic Countermeasures. What an amazing, amazing artist she is. And by the way, she will be on our show in two weeks. Boy, that's a timely interview. The lighting designer for the Foo Fighters was Tom Sutherland. We're trying to find out who did the overall production design, but I believe it was Trevor Burke did the creative and screens. But boy, for everyone, what a great show that was. Uh, Yeah, it was really over the top, but hey, that's what the music is, over the top. But beautiful work, especially the floor, especially the projections. There was even some alternative reality in it, which was really weird too. So good work, everyone. Beautiful show. So Steve has our last question. It's Tony in North Carolina, and Tony writes, I keep hearing about jewel lighting. What is that? Okay, Tony. There are kind of two ways that people might approach lighting a show. There is that Stanley McCandless method, which is up and out at 45 to give you kind of, you know, as much sculpting as you can with a minimum number of lights. There's something from behind to add depth to that. And then there was his arch nemesis, Howard Bay who was a scenery lighting and costume designer. And Howard Bay, as were most of the Broadway designers, using what uh, Howard Bay called jewel lighting. Jewel lighting is you put a number of lights around a performer. You know, think about this maybe um, a dance concert. You might have a couple lights in the front of house. You might have a couple in the box positions. You might have a a high pipe end. You might have a couple from behind. You've got a boom with two or three lights. So you have maybe a dozen or so lights all focused on the performer. Think of the facets of a jewel. And this light coming in helps give you the, the maximum flexibility in how you can present that performer on stage. So I think, you know, if you go back to old Stanley McCandless here, Nothing wrong with him, but he was working in a different world. I mean, he understood what jewel lighting was. He was experimenting with a minimum number of lights and how could I produce a really great look on stage. Howard Bay um, was not his nemesis, but Howard Bay didn't care. He was working on Broadway, and he had a different budget and a different agenda. So today, I think we see a lot of jewel lighting approaches on the university level. So that's kind of how I would roughly describe uh, jewel lighting. What about you guys? I mean, I think you nailed it. Um, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what else to say about it other than you, 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 you defined it. Well, you know, you, you know I, I think what's missing, I'm going to say what's missing, uh, and being nostalgic, are people like Howard Bay. I mean, think about all those designers in the mid-20th century and early 60s who did scenery, lighting, and costume. I mean, they really understood what they were trying to put on stage. And I have nothing against specialists. I'm a specialist myself. But boy, they thought about productions in a different way. They thought about it holistically. And, and Howard Bay, you know, he, he, I think he got, he got two Tonys. And one was for Man of La Mancha. And I'm not sure what the other one was for, but it would be an easy thing to find. But they were all like that. You know, Ming did lighting also. Not a lot, but he also did lighting. Oliver Smith, you know, all these great designers who who kind of, I don't know, laid the foundation for us today who are specialists. I also think directors were a lot different back then, too. The director was, I believe, much more powerful uh, back then and much more holistic. But now we have a whole series of directors who come from the devised world. So it's a lot more open and a lot more creative in that respect. It's fluid. Shows evolve more nowadays. Mm -hmm. And thank God we have the tools to do that, right? To be able to evolve with the shows. So, yeah. I don't know about jewel lighting. I I just like the the show, you know. (laughs) I just just throw lights up at every angle I can and hope for the best. (laughs) But how about you, Driscoll? (laughs) 
I just point everything at center stage. There you go. Down center. <laughs> you just fun. hang a bunch of projectors and hope for yeah, the best. They're everywhere. Exactly. Hope, for the best. hope for the best. <laughs> Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tells us that once again you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, YouTube, LiveDesignOnline.com, Amazon Prime Music, and just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on LightTalk.org for future guests, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate, the law firm of Flecked, Flocked, Flare and Glare and their paralegal snoots will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, the Big D, and just left of the Chisholm Trail. And be sure to join us next week when Zach, Steve, and I pontificate about more useless things and crazy shenanigans in our industry. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Toodles. Toodles. Toodles.